Hey, Eastern Michigan family and friends. Welcome to Black History 365. We are so glad to have each and every one of you with us today. My name is Taquanda. I serve as the social media strategist here at Eastern and a happy Black History Month, y'all. So we are most definitely excited about today's conversation. Uh, you guys get a chance to have uh, one of the, I would have to say, one of the top folks in, in my circle. <laughs> I get to bring you guys into a live conversation with Tony Carter. Uh, she is an EMU alum, an amazing uh, human resources mogul. She is doing the thing and I get to share you. I get to share her with y'all. So we're excited. So as you guys come on in and have this conversation with us, make sure that you hit that share button on Facebook, on YouTube, or if you're on Twitter, make sure that you are sharing this broadcast as well. We want to make sure that all of your timeline is aware that we are celebrating Black History 365 days of the year here at Eastern Michigan University. Also, we welcome your comments and your questions. Little disclaimer, though, we are talking about Black history. So if your comments or your question is not relevant to the topic at hand, we're going to ask for you to contact us through our inbox because we love your questions and we love your comments. Um, or also email us at social underscore media at emich.edu. And we will make sure that we answer those in a timely manner. But today we are talking about Black history and how we are paving the way forward. So without further ado, we're going to get into this conversation. You see, I love the comments that are coming in. Everybody's like, yes, she's amazing. See, I, I love the fact that our viewers are loving our guest today. So uh, without further ado, Tony Carter is an energetic and eager human resource professional with over 25 years of experience in human resources and 13 years of multi-unit experience. Tony has worked in the industry as far as retail, as well as in recently in biotech. She's serving as the senior director at Ver Biotechnology incorporated leading in diversity, equity, and inclusion as far as their strategy is concerned and supporting the organization as one of their human resource business partners. She's excited to be working in what she calls her dream job as, as in her role within DNI in the company strategy, as well as connecting senior leaders on business growth and being a great support to the organization's mission um, for the greater good of humanity. She's had experience um, with working with Walmart, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Tony attended Eastern and obtained her bachelor's degree in business administration with a major in human resources and a minor in communications in 2002. Uh, she is was very active on campus. She was chapter president of our sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She is a, a member of Phi Sigma Pi Honors Fraternity and a committee chair for the Black Student Union. After Upon graduating, she also became the scholarship chair, which we'll learn a little bit more about that for EMU Black Alumni Association, where she awarded over 20 over $20,000 in scholarships to undergraduate students with a financial need here at Eastern. In 2008, she graduated from Central with an MSA in Human Resources Administration. Um, I can go on and on and on. She just recently took a leap of faith and moved um, and relocated to uh, DC. So we'll hear a little bit about that. And she's won numerous awards. She's a war recipient of the Quad County Urban League um, She Rose and She Rose um, Award for her work within the local community as far as the greater Chicago area is concerned. And in her spare time, she enjoys traveling, spending time with those she loves, and helping people fulfill their purpose and their dream and their God-given mission. Without further ado, <laughs> I welcome my friend, my soror, and my EMU fellow alum, Tony Carter to our conversation today. Hello, hello. Hey, Tony. Hey. <laughs> so again, I am overjoyed to be able to have this candid conversation about Black history and especially talking about Black history at Eastern. We've been able to personally live it all out um, being students at Eastern and then also going into, you know, our professional careers and what that looks like. 
and I get to have a conversation with my friends. So <laughs> I am excited. It doesn't get better than that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. So how have you been? Well, I've been great. But before I get started, I first of yes. all, I want to thank the alumni, the faculty and the administration at Eastern Michigan University. It is incredible to be able to come and speak to my alma mater about some of the things that I'm doing. And I'm honored and humbled for this opportunity. So I have been great living my best life in D.C., being inspired by Black excellence around me. So I'm doing good. I love it. I remember when, you know, you had announced that you were moving to D.C. I was like, but when you just, okay, we going to D.C. We right. going to D.C. It's happening. <laughs> it's like, it's here. We here. Well, thank you again for, again, uh, for joining us. I appreciate it. I, I talked a little bit about, you know, just your career and your background and the comment box is like, floating with love already. So uh, tell us a little bit about your journey and especially, you know, being going from a student because we may have some students that are watching or some prospective students that are watching and then leading into your dream job where you are right now. So I know I don't read the bio, but it's so much better to hear from the person concerning your journey. So can you share with us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So I started Eastern in 1998. And one of the things that I would tell any incoming freshman is do not allow anyone to force you to choose a major because you're probably going to change it. Mm -hmm. And so I spent my first two years doing my graduate, you know, my basic studies. And then I took a career assessment that actually led me into human resources. So spent a lot of time with Lorraine Smith at Career Services, really figuring out my journey. And we landed on human resources and training and development. So I did two internships with Home Depot and one with UPS. And then the rest was history. I was able to go to school for my graduate degree in human resources. And I've been in the field for 25 years. So I definitely encourage incoming freshmen to what I call be the triple threat. So get an internship before you graduate so that you have education you also have the experience and you also have the intellect. So that makes you a triple threat. And so I was competitive in the market when I graduated from Eastern to compete for HR roles. So I've worked at many retailers like Home Depot, mm -hmm. Sears, Holdings, Walmart. And now I completely changed and worked in biotech. But all companies made a difference and all companies supported my personal mission and my personal passion. So that is how I landed in this role. That is awesome. Because um, I, I know of of course um all of those transitions but like let's talk about like your time at walmart because you were with them for you know for quite a quite a while and, and how was that as far as like you mentioned supporting just your vision and um your overall goals so i spent 12 years at walmart and there's nothing that i can't say about my time working for the largest retailer in the world it's a global company when I traveled the world, I was able to, you know, check out different stores, Mass Mart and, you know, South Africa and mm -hmm. all these beautiful things that really make up that global retailer. I learned a lot about really, you know, multi-unit leadership. I learned a lot about investing in the community, making sure that diversity, equity and inclusion is not a separate entity of your strategy, but also a part of the mission and the goals and values of the company. So I grew up at Walmart. I started in my 20s and I left in my 40s. It's all love. Some of them are probably on a broadcast. So <laughs> that transition to biotech really and truly has been amazing for me because biotech, you know, I want to always work for a company that wants to make a difference. And so the mission of beer is a world without infectious disease. So it doesn't get better oh, than nice. that to be a part of the greater good of humanity. And so I think those are the similarities. Some of the things that are different is one sells product. The other one supports patient, patient advocacy and making sure that our patients are in the forefront, but they both make a difference in the world. So it's been a great journey. I love it. I absolutely love it. So we are talking about Black History Month and um, and Black history in general. And I know with both of us being like student leaders and we've had our first hand is, is seeing Black history also being made, you know, at mm -hmm. Eastern. Um, so talk to us a little bit about like what Black history means, you know, to you. And then I know, for instance, when I and then also how it was when you got on campus and then leading into, you know, now as we're adults, because like when I got on campus, I went, as you know, like I went to a prim primarily, you know, white uh, schools, uh, Caucasian schools from 
elementary to high school. So being around and having so many things dedicated to Black history, dedicated to MLK, like was an amazing experience for me. So let's talk a little bit about Black General and what that means to you and then also your experience as a student and leading into now. Absolutely. So Black History Month should be 365. So I love that this series is talking about us being 365 and not just one month out of the year. We are truly the personification of perseverance and adversity. The things that we've done over generations to really overcome the pain and the barriers that are being inflicted on us, even now when we transition into focusing on generational wealth and making sure that we have the same resources that, you know, that the Caucasian students have. I think it's just amazing. And in our lifetime to see the first African-American president and vice president in office, I think is just an example of how we are a part of Black history. So I think we should be yeah. celebrated all day, every day. And I also think that Black history is such a, a such a touching moment to talk about the adversity of Black people. So that's what it means to me. As a student, I, I have to brag on my friends. I had an opportunity to see the first African-American dance troupe form, the version yeah. of dance troupe, right? Some of my sorority sisters were a part of that. The first, you know, African American homecoming king, my very good friend David Wilson. So we were we were trailblazing, and so I was happy to be a part of that and to be chapter president of a historically African American sorority, Delta Sigma Theta, which is also a nonprofit organization, and being able to lead the campus and lead also across the state was really inspirational. So I was a member of Black Student Union. I was the princess. I had advocacy with Eastern Michigan Black alumni. So I really experienced my growth and some of my closest friends in college. But that's when I learned how magical Black Black people really are, was actually in college. Yes, I love it. I love it. Just being able to be around, as, as we say, Black girl magic and Black boy joy, right? Like literally we lived it out even in our undergraduate and steady living it out during our, you know, adult years, as I like to say, I like to call it adult years. So let's talk a little bit about like your um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and how important that is to you. And especially during times as the times of these that we're in right now. You know, I think it's interesting that diversity, equity, inclusion is such a buzz phrase right now, right? But it's been important for a very, very long time and always near and dear to me. And I think each each word in that phrase deserves its own platform and entity, right? So diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of talent. In order to have the best performing company, the best performing team, you need to have a diverse team because if everyone thinks the same, you're going to get the same product. But if you want what we call the best of the best, then you want to have diverse talent in your team and you want to have a diverse perspective. I typically hire people that think differently than me because I think that complements what we're trying to do. And inclusion, really, you should be able to, you know, have a a sense of belonging and well-being at work and not feel like you have to do something separate just to come to work, but that you can that you can bring your values and your core beliefs to work every day. And equity is about making sure everyone has the same the opportunity to resources, equal pay, equal rights. And it's something that we'll continue to fight for because we, we started in a society has, that has been very unbalanced. Mm-hmm. And so I think that is something that we'll be advocating for and fighting for decades and years to come. But as long as you have the passion, you'll never stop fighting. So it's something that I, you know, I love. I can do it. You know, it's, it's what I call when your passion intersects with your purpose. That's the Black girl magic. And that's, that's what diversity, it. equity, inclusion does for me. So I love it. Absolutely. And I think like it's so important to talk about how like I love the fact that you brought up like it's interesting that it's a buzzword now. Right. (laughs) Like that. That's real. Like it should have been a part of our everyday, you know, way of doing things, even when it comes to in, in the marketplace, as well as our personal lives. And it's interesting how it's become legit like a buzzword or how people feel like, oh, now I need to put a focus on it. When it should have been a focus a long time ago. Well, I think it's interesting about George Floyd, right? Is it mm-hmm. is it is it um, concerning because it was shown to the world, or is it concerning because it happened? Because yeah. it's been happening to us every day. So mm-hmm. the fact that you had to face that ugliness really isn't my issue. That's an issue that you have to look within yourself and ask yourself: Did you know these things were happening, and you decided to be silent? Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So can you share with us like how it is um, as far as showing up day to day um, in your new role and what that looks like and then how important it is for you to leave a legacy for family and even for those who are watching afar as far as, you know, because you could believe it or not, I always tell folks it's like you never know who's watching mm -hmm. and who considers you as a mentor and how you're paving the way, you know, for, for them. So let's talk a little bit about that, your day to day and the importance of legacy. Absolutely. So I'll talk about showing up as yourself every day. I think if you are a part of a, co a company or a group or even in your family and you can't be your authentic self, you, you need to you need to protect your peace and you need to look at doing something different because that is a critical part of you thriving in any environment. And so I'm an advocate for that. One of the reasons why I got into diversity, equity and inclusion is so that people can have a sense of belonging in the workplace. And we celebrate different cultures and adversity and what that means to travel the world as a you know a black and brown girl and what it mm -hmm. means to actually talk to our sons about what happens when you get a driver's permit and how yes. driving while black is a real thing. Right. And so we should be able to talk about that in a break room at work. We should be able to talk about that any. In, in, in a work meeting. So that is important. And I think that we need to continue to fight for bringing our authentic self to work. So that's what it means to me and what that means to our society. When it comes to paving the way, I was one of the first people on my mom and dad's side to get my undergraduate and graduate degree. And I would hope that that legacy passed on to members of my family because they inspire me every day to do mm -hmm. my best and be my best self. So it's important for people that are younger than us to see that people that look like us can do the unthinkable. And Ooh, so you have to be that inspiration, whether you want to be or not, you're going to be. So why not do it well? I love it. I absolutely love it. Why not do it well? Like you're going to get in, listen, do it, <laughs> do it up. So uh, even in the midst of um, operating and showing up as our authentic selves and operating in our passion day to day, um, going forward, I want to talk a little bit about amplifying, you know, black voices, and especially when it comes within our career fields and the positions that we are in and how important that is. So talk to us a little bit how you personally feel like you amplify black voices within your career set and then even in your personal life too. Okay, so I'll start with the work and then I'll go into the personal. So from a work standpoint, we can't have black voices if we don't have representation. So really challenging our companies to make sure that we have representation at the director level, the C-suite level, to have representation of people of color, to be that advocacy and that voice for people of color and being, you know, being comfortable with looking at the analytics and the data to show where we're going and what we need to target our focus on to make sure we increase that representation. So I would say that's one component of it. The second component is I, I'm really passionate about making sure that people of color have what I call a culture coach, a culture coach, right? Mm -hmm. Someone who helps you really get acclimated into the organization, a, a safe space for you to have the psychological safety to speak your truth and say how you really feel and how to navigate difficult meetings and difficult conversations. So I think whether it be a mentor or a coach, just someone guiding you along the way is another important component of making sure your voice is heard. And then last but not least, someone like me who has the autonomy to make sure my voice is heard, bringing other people along the way and making sure their voices are heard as well in the workplace. So I think that that's my obligation and my responsibility as a woman of color to make sure that everyone's voice is heard. And whether you're vocal in meetings or not, there's other ways to really get gain that information from individuals who may not be as comfortable speaking in groups. So we have mm -hmm. Menti Meter, we have so many different surveys and tools to just make sure voices are heard. And I encourage everyone to just challenge ourselves to say, are we listening to the person that's the loudest or are we creating a platform where everyone can be heard and everyone can be seen? So that is that is really what yeah. I feel in the workplace. Personally, I don't think anybody that knows me will say that I've been quiet. <laughs> Unless I'm frustrated and I'm really trying to figure out how to how to proceed next. But, uh -huh. you know, just making sure that from a personal standpoint, that 
if I feel like, and sometimes believe it or not, I do feel like my voice isn't heard, but I have to come back mm -hmm. and regroup and make sure that I communicate in a productive way that has impact and not a dis disruptive way that just creates unnecessary conflict. So it's still a personal as adversity that I'm still working through as well. So I'm a work in progress. <laughs> Listen, and I think every, I think everybody is right. Especially, especially in that area. And even, even more so, like I, I found that when we are um, doing our best to, you know, amplify um, black voices and to bring people up, you know, as, as we're about that process, like, um, somebody had to do it for us. Or even if someone did not do it for us, we know that, you know, we have to do it for others. But then also like, you know, some some days it's a work in progress. Like you said, like, yeah, I want to voice it. Should I, should I not, you know, and then we have that hard, um, those hard decisions and we work through them and, and we continue to perfect and keep going. And I want to talk a little bit about those like hard conversations, right? And especially you being in, in human resources, like how has it been to have those hard conversations and what would you, um, what would you give as a advice, you know, to, to others who may be in a position where they may not feel comfortable, you know, talking, um, to, it might be a supervisor or, you know, or something like that. Um, but knowing that hard conversations need to be had because there are people out there who may be watching and it's just like, yeah, you know, Tony, I think that's great that, yeah, we got to make these, you know, we got to have these conversations, but where do I start and how do I have them? I think over the years I've learned a couple of things. One, I've learned that sometimes, because I'm I'm definitely a person that will be very easily comfortable with telling you the truth. <laughs> but I think that people have to be in a place and a space to want to receive that. And so mm -hmm. it may not be in that moment. You have to give people an opportunity to take some time to process what's being said and regroup, right? The second mm -hmm. piece of it is you have to look beyond the surface. So, and that's a great example when it comes to like the label of a angry black man or angry, Ooh. angry black woman. Well, let's talk about why they're angry, right? right let's right. not focus on the end result. Let's talk about the journey. And I think yes. that just really having that empathy and understanding the journey of a person and how they reach that point of frustration will help you connect with them on a much deeper level as you navigate together on what's the best resolution for that situation, because we're very dismissive of the behavior, but we don't take the time to show empathy and really look below the surface to understand why are they acting that way or why do they feel that way? And in order to really and truly make sure that, you know, you have that, you know, that opportunity to have the difficult conversation, you first and foremost have to be able to establish a connection. Mm -hmm. It's OK to say, I understand that you're frustrated. Help, you know, I want to get some more information on that or to say I've been there. Right. I think, you know, compassion and em empathy is really huge for connection. So mm -hmm. don't don't just you know, sometimes we go into a conversation like we've never had a bad day. It's right. OK to say I've had right. a bad day, too. It's not today. Yours is right. today. Mine is not. But how do we how do we navigate that? <laughs> And how do we continue to connect and, and build and move forward? And one of the things I tell my family all the time, even though they will probably tell you that I definitely am open to disagreeing, <laughs> but I love I love them more than I love the desire to be right. Uh -huh. and, and one That's thing good. my boss at Veer, Stephen Rice, is really big about, it's not about being right. It's about doing what's right. Mm -hmm. And doing what's right does not require a win-lose. And so I've been very fortunate to have mentors that continue to pour into me um, even to this day that remind me that it's not about being right. And so going into a difficult conversation, if you go on into it, trying to be, you know, with the goal of being right, you've already lost the discussion and the purpose. The purpose is connection and establishing how we want to move forward in the most productive way. So that would be my advice for difficult conversations. I have them very often, but I do come back and say, okay, this person's not prepared to receive uh -huh. that message today. So we're going to come back to this in a couple of weeks and let them kind of simmer on what we what we talked about today. I love it. I love it. Like knowing when, right? Like even though you may need to have it and you might start it, it's okay to stop in the midst of the conversation. Okay to but pause. You know what? We can revisit this a little bit later. Like that. Read, read the room. Some people that are yes. uncomfortable having difficult conversations, they want to get it over with. So they kind of like speed through it and nobody understands what's happening and what's going mm -hmm. on. But that's because you didn't do your homework and you didn't pr appropriately prepare to have that difficult conversation. 
That's good. So I'm going to take some comments from our Facebook and our uh, YouTube um, viewers. So again, thank you everybody for watching. You are now watching EMU Black History 365 and I'm having a candid conversation with my good friend and soar, Tony Carter. So um, we have a question um, and this comes from Nautica and she says, does your company have a team for DNI or do you spearhead it yourself? So we are building our DEI team in Veer, and I I love it. So right now I'm leading it, but I'm currently looking for a DEI senior manager, and for an organization that is maturing to make such an investment in diversity, equity, and inclusion with less than a thousand employees, I find it to be absolutely incredible, and I can't wait to see the growth and the expansion of the diversity, equity, and inclusion program at Veer because the best is yet to come. Awesome. So a couple of other comments. We got Jennifer over at Facebook and she says exactly people are watching even when you don't notice um, half of the time. So that is good. And some other comments. Janelle says good information. So and uh, Jennifer also comes back in and says, yes, we need to have the hard conversations. The dialogue can start with those willing to share and experiences and suggestions for us to move forward. And I, I love the fact of that, like sharing experiences. And I, I think that what we've seen, and you mentioned George Floyd, like we've seen throughout the past, what you might as well say, like a couple, you know, years, so a couple of years is like um, those conversations and sharing of experiences in places that normally would not have, you know, shared those experiences share those experiences and it's good to know that at least individuals are open to discussing so yep and mariah over at youtube says so good tony um so we're gonna go right back in again if you have any comments or questions by all means hit the comment box and um shoot them on over we would love to address those so tony tell let's talk about like your experiences you know we talked a little bit about your experience as an emu student but giving back you know now that you um have graduated and i know that you've done some amazing things with the black alumni association so i want to take some time to talk a little bit about that about paving the way and giving back and going back full circle that is actually something that's very very important to me and I didn't realize it until now, just being 21 years ago, joining Delta Sigma Theta, Sorority Incorporated at Eastern Michigan University, I had access to incredible, talented, and really you know, courageous African-American women that mm -hmm. were investing in me as a collegiate student. So I will always appreciate and remember that. When I was an undergraduate student, I received the Eastern Michigan Black Alumni Association Scholarship Award several years in a row. And it was very important when I graduated to join the Eastern Michigan Alumni, um, Eastern Michigan Black Alumni, and also chair and co-chair the scholarship program. So mm -hmm. I raised money for the scholarships that actually was, you know, something that I received and I was able to pay it forward and give it to other students who probably needed the additional support similar to me in my undergraduate experience. And then the last thing is very important to me is legacy. Mm -hmm. And so one of the programs that I left with the Eastern Michigan Black Alumni Association before I relocated out of the state of Michigan was a program called Young and Successful, how to be successful as an Eastern Michigan alumni if you're under the age of 30. And that's where the alumni uh, graduates of Eastern Michigan actually come back to campus and talk to college students about what life is like post-graduation, whether they mm -hmm. want to be an entrepreneur or go into marketing or business or chemistry. You know, I can go on and on about the need for Black people in STEM. And so right. that program can carried on for years after I left the Eastern Michigan Black Alumni Association. Mm -hmm. And so that's my legacy. It's very important for me to leave a legacy and, and just really and truly make a difference and an impact wherever I go. I love it. I love it. And I think like, um, and again, if you, if you're watching here and you're not connected with uh, the Black Alumni Association or even um, the overall EMU Alumni Association, please, by all means, get connected because there are students that, that feed and want and are longing for individuals like you to, to sow your talents and, and what your career industry pathways um, 
into their into their lives because I know personally I've had the opportunity of being at that particular program you know, you're mentioning and so many students will come back and be like, hey, can I sit down and talk with you? Hey, I think this is great. Or I was, you know, they're in that transition mode, right, that we talked about before, like not knowing what you are um, called to do in life and trying to figure out your path. And, and it's those type of programs and that type of conversation that helps our students figure out uh, what they desire to do and how they want to change the world. So. I love how college students think when they graduate that all these companies are going to be lined up and <laughs> offer them six figure jobs. I'm I'm into it. Like I was right. one of them, right? <laughs> However, the purpose of the program I started was to help them navigate post graduation and competing for you know the job of their dreams and what that looked like and what that meant. And so it's mm -hmm. great to hear from someone who recently graduated who's actually living and working in that field. Absolutely. And they get the say they get the real deal. Like, well, you might not have got that six figs, but you know, you got a little something to start start you out. Oh, entry level, <laughs> right? <laughs> gotta work your way up. Gotta work. Gotta work your way up. We have a comment from Valeria over at YouTube saying, "Thank you for not only leading the way for younger Black and Brown girls, but for helping give tips on how we can continue to lead and help others." Oh, thank you, Valeria. <laughs> All right. So um, I want to talk about how and as we wrap this on up, um, what we can learn from EMU's past to embrace the future. Um, as you know, we've dealt with our, uh, as I say, you know, our trials, our tribulations and, mm -hmm. and dealings of, you know, racial injustice um, on campus, as well as, you know, making our strides as um as black students, you know, as black professionals, you know, on campus and off campus, but how can we learn from Eastern's past to embrace Eastern's future? I think one of the things that we have to do is, is really and truly put that stamp on and, and say, we are not going to be, you know, we are not going to be our past and we're, and we're going to learn from our past and we're going to embrace the progression in our future. And so Eastern has had some high profile allegations on discrimination and even assault. And, and I look at some of the students and the faculty and administration who've really taken a stand and really understand that silence can be considered alignment and no longer yeah. are we going to be silent, but we're going to advocate and protest for what we think is right and equal rights. And we're not going to ignore the things that are happening to students of color or students who feel like they have been, you know, physically or or verbally assaulted at our university. So to me, we are living proof um, as an eagle. I call myself a true yeah. EMU eagle of what that progression should be. And we are still a work in progress. I think one of the things that was most powerful for me was last year in 2020, when they named a building after a professor that I find to be one of the most amazing professors of my lifetime, Dr. Judy Sturgis Hill. And yeah. that to me, represents the progression and the desire for change. To name that building after Dr. Hill has been amazing and something that I'm glad I was able to witness because she touched my life so greatly during my time at Eastern. So continuing to move forward, but don't be silent. Make sure that people hear the ones that need to be heard and be an advocate for what's right and don't put up with what's wrong. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Tony, for coming on to our live today and and uh, speaking about Black history and sharing your experience. I appreciate this conversation. I know I'm full from it, and I'm pretty sure that all of you know our our viewers are full from it. If you're catching the replay, make sure that you hit up the comment box to let us know that you watched the replay. And if you have any questions uh, for Tony, you can drop them in the comment box and we'll make sure that she gets them. Uh, just a few. <laughs> Janelle says, best lunch break ever. <laughs> that, oh my that, goodness. I think, all, I think all the Deltas are going to comment. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but these, again, these are all the women that I look up to. Janelle Washington, Janelle Williams Lloyd, these are all the women that have been investing in me for over 20 years. So I, if, if they, if I make them proud, then I've done my job today. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you again, Tony. And thank you everyone for watching. Uh, we will be back this Friday with another EMU Black History 365. But we'll be talking about, actually, we will be um, having our remembering Dr. Judy Sturgis Hill. I'm excited. And yes, I, I am over 
overjoyed about Friday's conversation. This, this whole series just fills my heart so good. <laughs> fills my heart so good, as I say. Uh, but Fridays, I'm trying to compose myself now so <laughs> I don't cry on camera. I know. I know. <laughs> on camera with everyone because Judy played a huge, um, a hu had a huge influence even in, in my life. So you'll hear from some of her colleagues. You'll hear from a best friend. You'll hear from um, some of our friends. Oh, I could say that, you know, so make sure that you are um, tuning in with us right back here on Facebook and on YouTube for Friday at noon as we remember Dr. Judy Sturgis Hill. And for all things Black history, you can go to emish.edu slash black dash history dash month for the rest of our programming for the rest of this month so again thank you for watching thank you tony again for joining us and, and we thank you for making this such an easy interview it's like i was having coffee with my friend listen <laughs> i love it even though we're we're states away <laughs> so thank you thank you thank you and um we look forward to having everyone on friday at noon have a great day everyone bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.